Hey, how you doing, everybody? How you doing, Jay? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm very good, man. I'm excited. Uh, today, we got a science-minded guy, member of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, very well known, uh, and we touched on a lot of different topics. It's going to be a great episode. Let's do this. Here we are. Boy, I got to tell you, Jay, I love that new video intro that we're running, man. That thing is awesome. Took a little bit of time from our uh, our video guy, but uh, was well worth it. So, yeah, you know. no, I, I think he uh, was well worth the money we spent on him anyways. Yeah. What are we what are we paying him right now? Uh, nothing, I think. All right. Well, tell him he can go ahead and double that. Doing such a great job. <laughs> okay. Fair so, enough. Want to get right into it today. Uh, we have an esteemed guest with us. He is a board member of the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies. Uh, he's also one of the directors of PR. Gentleman has appeared on many television programs, um, podcasts. You've seen him on TV. You've seen him on the internet. And uh, he's a good friend of the show. So we want to welcome uh, Mr. Alejandro Rojas. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So uh, for those of our viewers and uh, listeners that don't quite know who you are, maybe give us a little bit about your background and uh, what got you into paranormal and UAP type uh, research. Yeah, you know what? Uh, they're actually at the SEU website, exploreseu.org. Our latest journal has an interview that one of my colleagues did with me. So you can really get my background in there uh, if you want more. But otherwise, you know, I have, uh, I got the bug for this topic in journalism school. Um, you know, I noticed that there's some credible stuff out there that's not being covered. I felt that it wasn't being covered as we would cover any normal topic. So I picked up the beat uh, along the way, got involved with MUFON. I lived by headquarters. So I was uh, one of their functional directors and in their board meetings and uh, their spokesperson for a period of time in like the early 2000s. Um, <clears throat> And then got a job with this uh, Open Minds at TV, this guy who wanted to start a website and figure out what's going on with UFOs. Uh, we did kind of a newsy type of thing there. And uh, then got uh, eventually got involved with uh, SCU. And um, now I'm working for a software company called uh, Enigma Labs, where we're developing an app and some tools to be able to analyze UAP sighting data to try to figure this out so it's a really exciting project right and this is project project is this something that's going to be global as a project or it's more centralized um it's going to be i mean it, it's definitely u.s centric right now in, for a couple reasons one because we're here uh for the most part uh the other is that the U.S. has done the most, you know, there's, we've had the most organizations, we've had, you know, a lot of information gathering, people don't realize, you know, we talk about government secrecy, and sure, there have been some secrets, but our government has actually released the most UFO documents in any country in the world. So the government has a lot of information. So, um, so it for that reason, it is and it gets a little more more difficult to get out. Our intentions are to be global in nature. We do have some inroads with some um, international organizations. Um, so over time, we'll be ingesting more and more international data. And you mentioned that you were an investigator as well with MUFON for, for quite some time. What were some of your best cases that you've had that really sort of, I wouldn't say solidified the phenomenon for you, but sort of gave you more of an engagement with the phenomenon? Yeah, I would say twofold. Um, the normal kind of nuts and bolts, more rigorous type of thing I focus on. And then the weird, you know, getting introduced introduced to kind of the weird. So to start with the first, you know, um, I decided I need to talk to witnesses. I had read just about every book I could get my hands on, including, you know, old historical books. Uh, and so I was like, you know, it, it's about time to start to talk to some witnesses. So uh, luckily, MUFON headquarters, I turned out, was nearby where I live, uh, the international headquarters. So I got to meet John Schusler, who was the director at that time and one of the founders, and he's been a great mentor of mine. And I became a field investigator. The very first case I had was a uh, security officer, and I cite this case a lot. 
because I think it's a great example of why this should be taken seriously. Um, he was doing security at a bank um, near where I worked, actually, in about Lakewood, Colorado, under um, Lookout Mountain. So if people are very familiar with that, you know, west of town, you see the, the radio lights and everything if you live in Denver. So everybody knows Lookout. Uh, also, the plane from DIA, there's a, a route that goes over Lookout. Well, this guy was a security officer just fresh from Iraq, and he was noticing this object you know, above Lookout Mountain, kind of TikTok shaped. But it was sitting there kind of doing some weird kind of turns and twists. He went about his work and made note of it. Uh, but walking around, you know, he was still in that kind of hypersensitive state to notice what your surroundings, look for and report any uh, potential issues. So he was keeping an eye on it. And after 20 minutes where it was still there and then realizing that it seemed like commercial airlines were flying fairly close to it, he called the FAA. They said, we don't care. We don't do UFOs. He called the police. He called a bunch of different places until finally, and I think it was uh, the police department, referred him to move on. And so he called us. Um, but you know, I called the FAA, kind of just due diligence. I knew what they were going to say. I had done that before. And they say, we don't investigate UAP. And I was like, you know, I'm not invest asking you to investigate. I'm asking to know if there are any other reports like that during that period of time. And they did say they looked into it and didn't have any. But uh, I think this one was eye-opening to me in a few man uh, a few ways. If someone from Iraq, you know, a soldier from Iraq is reporting a potential safety issue uh, to airline, uh, to commercial airlines, you would think that would be a big deal. But nobody cares. He called the airport. He called FAA. Nobody wanted to hear it. That is, and which is especially highlighted in today's world, an extremely irrational response, um, irresponsible response, all because of this taboo around the word or the idea of UFOs. So I, I think that's a great, that was kind of eye-opening, but it was a perfect example of why this topic should be taken seriously. And luckily in today's world, at least the Defense Department and many others are saying that. You know, that was irrational. That was silly. Although I don't think we've revisited just how irrational and weird that was that FAA or an airport wouldn't be paying attention to the safety of a commercial airline. So that was a good case. The other one was, uh, I think just because I was open and, uh, I, you know, I've listened to people, I started having people come to me claiming that they were having alien abduction experiences. And that was really weird for me. These were people that I typically uh, often already had a rapport with and I liked a lot. Um, and so that was really strange. And to be honest, uh, that topic and that idea for me has kind of been in the same place the entire time since then. In other words, uh, it's hard to figure anything out. I would say I've done some investigation, but it doesn't go anywhere um, beyond kind of like anecdotal information. Um, so I don't know what to do with that kind of thing. I think that it should be taken seriously just because of the number of people who seem to be experiencing genuine trauma from um, these uh, uh, perceived experiences. Uh, so we need we should figure out what it is, whether that be some more mundane kind of psychological phenomena or, of course, what it could be some third party involvement, which is obviously has huge implications. So um, yeah, that was another weird one. I wasn't prepared to take that, you know, to really go there. Um, but you kind of, you guys probably uh, might have feel the same that once you get involved with this stuff, it's kind of impossible not to go there. Right? Yeah. Yeah, actually that's been the case for, for a lot of uh, different guests that we've had on. At first, for myself anyways, I was quite narrow-minded. I thought, you know, no, it has to be just UFOs aliens all the other cryptid stuff didn't make any sense you know i didn't believe in the bigfoot stuff and even though i live right by harrison hot springs which is like you know huge on uh bigfoot and now i'm just like i i it's it keeps seeping in like i keep seeing it over and over again and i don't know about you louis but i that seems to be like a lot of our guests mentioned different things like uh, you know, seeing cryptids and, and different yeah. beings and entities. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, 
dude. Even the big name, like really big name guys like George Knapp and guys like that who spent, you know, decades doing this kind of stuff. They started off as nuts and bolts UFO guys. And the more they learn about it, you're either going to keep an ignorant opinion of, no, it can't be, or you're going to let some of that stuff in and go, hey, maybe this is crazier than we think. Maybe it's everything. Maybe it's interdimensional beings and visitors and time travelers. Like then you get into the world of cryptids and blue orbs and portals and everything else. And everything we thought was sci-fi for the last 40, 50 years, it's turning out that there may be some credence to it and it's just getting more and more interesting so like you said Alejandro it's you get hooked and uh if you're a science-minded person uh you want to find the solution to the problem even in like mathematics or anything else you want to know what it is and this kind of thing that it's like grabbing a fistful of sand you feel like you have it when you go to look there's no more sand so yeah exactly and that's how investigating that topic kind of feels um and you know, and, and it's not even just if you want to or you get hooked. It's like if you're looking into this topic, you can't help. Um, and I think the DOD is dealing with this right now, actually. Uh, I My perception, and I think I, what I see going on right now is that uh, a lot of people are take a lot of, uh, put a lot of stock in the word from people who have made uh, this current kind of environment possible people like lou elizondo who worked for the pentagon and came forward a uh, kind of a whistleblower um chris mellon who of course worked for uh deputy director of intelligence type of work you know um very high level people uh, and some of the people like they, they've worked with like jim semivan uh, who worked for the cia or gary nolan who's a very esteemed you know professor out of uh, stanford uh, has his own lab that uh, is very well, you know, regarded. Um, these are people at, you know, those kind of upper echelons. And those are the people who kind of brought all this forward and have been looking into this and have been uh, taking this serious. But these people themselves, uh, some of them believe they're experiencers. They say, I've experienced alien contact. So um, a lot of people, I think, take that as confirmation the government knows. And I think that that's the wrong take. I think the right take, and this is where people get lost, is the government's like us, even, you know, similar to the UFO community. It's just a bunch of people trying to figure stuff out, do their jobs, live their lives. They're just as freaked out by all of this as anybody else. Um, and But I think what's happening is they're the people that they relied on to create the OSAPs, who ran OSAP, who created the UAP task force under Navy intelligence who have been involved with moving this along. They uh, are, they kind of now have this baggage of being experiencers of looking into weirder stuff. And I really see the DOD trying to shake that off. They're trying to, we're not going to work with anybody in the past. We're starting from square one and going forward. I think that's what Avi Loeb did with Galileo. That's what NASA is going to do. And it makes sense in a way because you have to be responsible for the data that you're using and responsible for uh, the the uh, veracity of that data. Um, and if it's somebody else's data, it's hard to do that. Um, thankfully, you know, uh, they were the DOD was told by Congress, look at the old stuff because we do have Air Force. Uh, we do have a lot of good data from like the previous investigations. You know, a lot of people read Condon and they say, in fact, the Condon report helped create France's UFO investigation organization because they looked at it and said, this is not an argument against researching this topic. This is the best argument I've seen for researching this topic. And France and others have acted uh, that way in response to the Condon report, which was supposed to negate things. So we've got to look a lot of data there. Uh, but, you know, this this topic, the experience or thing still creeps into it. I think that their reaction is going to be to shake it off. I'm not sure. Uh, it's probably wise um, in some ways, maybe not in others, but uh, it kind of demonstrates the struggle that's been here um, to gain credibility for this topic. And even now we're in a spot where if you're a scientist or you're a NASA guy working on this topic and you have been a closeted experiencer, probably not a good time to reveal that. Probably, which is kind of sad to say, but we're not ready for it. It would probably be better to wait 
maybe a decade, wait till we have really concrete, you know, the credibility of this topic is solid. Because right now, you know, like what's happening to these other guys, I think that, you know, they're kind of being pushed aside a little bit, um, which is sad because they've got the best information. But at the same time, there's that liability that they're experiencers. I think there's more to it as well, because if it was just about professionals and former military people coming forward, the 2001 National Press Club hearings with Stephen Greer and all those high level guys, FAA guys and everything else, that would have done something big. But it seems like, you know, the the New York Times and the Tic Tac videos have spurred it on more. Maybe it's because of Tom DeLonge and To The Stars and there's a lot more media attention. And maybe that's a good thing because it didn't really get too far in 2001. They gave them their, you know, 15 minutes and said, OK, thank you very much. And they compartmentalized away and, you know, we got on with life. So it's more than just the the professionals coming forward. I think we need to find either real evidence through the private sector uh, rather than just relying on when's the government going to tell us, you know, this is a 70 yeah. year old secret. There's some implications for them acknowledging anything because then how do you stay plausible and say, well, we didn't know. Well, you sure mm -hmm. did know. So I don't see it going to come from the military complex before it comes from the private sector. That's just my opinion. No, I think you're right. And, and I'm kind of smiling because this allows me to get back to like the genius of Chris Mellon who kind of, engineered all of this and if you don't mind i'll go through that real quick sure, um and it came from different information and then interviews with him but um i mean that he saw this issue you know that there was all this information in the back there was all this stuff that people paid attention to i think the greer conference there were two problems one uh was that he he wasn't careful he did bring some people that were too far that i believe probably are liars and charlatans but that's the minority I'm talking maybe one or two individuals. The rest of those were high, high quality people. Um, so that kind of opens up the door for them to kind of get scared away a little. And the media, I don't think they knew what to do with it. You know, it was, I think it was just kind of mind blowing for everybody. And everybody's like, well, what, what is someone else going to do with it? Um, and it got dropped and nobody did anything with it. I don't, and it's because like this topic, it's been a real hot potato. Um, for anybody that has a, a lot of visibility to the public that needs to maintain credibility, you know, this isn't a topic anybody wants to touch. Um, Dennis Kucinich, you know, during that period of time, got attached to it because Shirley MacLaine wrote in a book that he she he was there when they had a UFO sighting. Dennis Kuc Kucinich uh, agreed, said, yeah, that's true. Uh, he got made fun of and it hurt him, you know, running uh, for president. So at that time, that's kind of how this was. It was still too much of a hot potato. But what Chris Mellon did, he saw was a couple of things that he needed to put up a lot of public pressure um, for people to see the credibility in the topic and then uh, to force some government agency to admit that they've been taking this seriously, that they've been investigating this topic. And that was his goal. That's why he couples with Tom DeLonge who is, you know, a rock star. That's why they, you know, get the TV show going. That's why they go to the New York Times and Politico and all of the media. And it worked like a charm because immediately, you know, you had the Nimitz people coming forward and confirming all of this information. And so it snowballed into this big thing. And even before they expected, the Navy comes out and says, yes, we take this seriously. That was a cue. And that was the legal justification for, um, Chris Mellon then to go to his buddies in the Armed Services Committee where he had worked for um, in the past and say, guys, it's time. You know, the Navy has said um, that they take this seriously. One, have you been briefed on that? And two, do you think this is an important topic? Um, and you need to get briefed to figure that out. So at first there was some, I think, kind of feigned political response that hey you guys didn't brief us on this what's going on i think you know in the military's defense many felt that there's not much to this so what what are we going to brief anybody on um but it happened and the briefings every senator who or congressperson who's come out of a any of these classified briefings has come out saying this is very serious we need to take this very serious and so it was kind of that combination that strategy that chris millen had put together um, and it worked like, you know, it would work perfectly, even better, I think, than they had expected. 
Um, so now we've got the Congress super energized on this topic. Uh, I'm more so, I think, than the DOD expected. And I think the DOD still kind of figuring out what to do. Um, how serious do we take this? Um, you know, what do we share with the public? Do we still want to try to get out of it? Because I think up until now, they've been doing that. They've been trying to wait it out and say, hey, is this new cycle going to end? And then we can kind of let this go. Uh, but I don't think they are going to get let go on this. Uh, so we'll see what they do. See, I've always thought that um, if if they reveal that the UAPs are real and that these crafts are not from, as far as we can tell, human-made uh, technologies, this opens the door to the possibility that the alien abduction is or phenomenon mm -hmm. is real, that the cattle mutilation phenomenon is linked, uh, that these orbs that people are seeing and that you know have been reported throughout the world, especially within the last 50 years, uh, in the 70s was really common in uh, forgot Central America. It, it gives possibility that all these things are linked to this phenomenon, and that's why they're trying not to leak that out too fast. Let's just ease the public into accepting that at least these crafts are here. Then we'll get to the other stuff that happens. It's not like we can do anything about the alien abduction anyways, yeah. right? But uh, have you found that your belief in the alien abduction case has increased since you've been with, with MUFON and started investigating and people reaching out to you? Like, has that more solidified it that uh, this phenomenon no. is happening? No, it hasn't. And here's why. Um, and this leads to the other question that I didn't get to that you um, had asked, which was, Where's the information going to come from? Um, and I think that is the scientific community. It's not, it's going to be from the public. It's not going to be from the military because all of this to do, like I just went over and how we got the military to talk. Even Chris Mellon wrote, Hey, I realize that this topic is going to have to remain classified. Luckily, Congress said, No, it doesn't have to be. We want a public end to this. But, um, that information they've already said what, what they research and how is classified. So I don't think they're going to be. They're not going to be, uh, and in some cases, rightfully so, forthcoming with their findings and their efforts. So I think you're right. Military, that's not where we're going to be able to get information. But the scientific community is, and I think that we've just got no science. We've got very little to no uh, expertise who have come to this topic. And even if you look at Bigelow or um, some of the other groups of scientists out there, even SCU or the SSE, uh, groups of scientists who have been willing to look at these topics, it's still only one or two individuals. Whereas in real science, a paper goes out and you have dozens of scientists beating it up and you really get to the, to the meat of something. We're only starting to get there. I think we're starting now where scientists are interested, they're gonna start writing papers, there's uh, data gathering. And I think that's really important because I think that's what will lead us where we need to go. And the reason I say no, as far as where I am, I try to stay agnostic on most topics, or at least not come down on one side or another, because I don't want to taint myself. And what I found in this field, um, just like lots of field of science, especially like space or astronomy, is that the answers turn out to be something you never would have imagined. You know, I never thought that Z would be the case. Before I found out that to be the case, I'm going on my podcast, I'm telling everybody, no, Z's not real, Z's not the, the answer. Turns out Z's the answer. So I mean, um, we just never know. So I'm open to either side, uh, but uh, I'm still open. Uh, yeah, I still haven't really, say I'd come down because I I'm just want to keep that, you know, curiosity, that scientific kind of curiosity to push that side of things, which like we do at SCU and, um, and NASA, I think we'll be doing. Um, I think that's really exciting. I think we are headed in a good place that way where the public is, regardless of what the government may or may not know, the public is finally going to start to get some real answers. And, and by the nature of science, it'll come out in bite sizes. So if the answer turns out to be abductions are real or something really wild like that, um, hopefully we'll be slow to get there, kind of like you suggested, even just organically in the scientific process of discovering that, because that's going to be you know, 
very, very difficult thing for uh, government and public to realize should that, you know, be the case. It's interesting to note that most of the big name people that we interview have all graduated to this sort of humble opinion of, yeah, I used to think, used to be really opinionated. Now I'm just not so sure and I'm open to anything. And, you know, if you're in the world of UFO Twitter or anything social media related, there's a lot of infighting and a lot of really opinionated people and say, like, you're an idiot. It's definitely this and it's definitely not that, which we have to be careful of because, A, this is above our pay grade anyway. We're trying to understand a much more civilized either um, race or just a phenomenon, even if it's atmospheric or, you know, environmental, it's above our pay grade. So it becomes very dangerous when you start making... Exactly you know, um, for sure statements with, like you said, no evidence. We really don't have anything. Whatever the government has, hasn't been released in full. So it's just anybody's best guess. So anything short of, hey, what's your opinion? And I, I think that's, you know, necessary for the full picture. Anything short of that cooperation is counter this movement. It's not pro movement because you're not getting anywhere <clears throat> fighting with people and just, you know, making yourself look stupid online, it needs to be more of a unified uh, uh, front. And again, if we're studying a civilization that's made it hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years longer than us, they didn't get there by killing each other and by infighting. They got there by using their collective resources for the betterment of everyone. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's refreshing that you have that opinion and most of our guests. Um, but I think we all need to take a page out of that book and say, we really don't know. It would be cool if it was this. I hope if it's this. But yeah. I don't know. And anything mm -hmm. we say today, we might look back in two years and be like, man, I was an idiot. How could I believe that now yeah. knowing what I know? So we need to keep a, a low keel on that type of thing. Yeah, it comes back to data and information. You know, um, I may be skeptical of your point of view, but at the same time, I may have a point of view that is not, um, you know, defendable either. Sure. So, uh, you know, and I think we have to realize that or I may at least be able to share, well, here's the data I have that I'm making my opinion on. Take a look and see what you think. Yeah. You know, that's the way the conversation should be going. Um, and they do at a lot of levels, which is really exciting. But certainly UFO Twitter gets overtaken by people who, like you say, are really staunch about their own point of view and are yeah. open to others. And that's not how you, you know, that's not how we're going to discover things or you're going to prove your point. Share information. Show us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the whole point, too, of, you know, um, the podcast was to learn from people. Right. And we've learned so far a lot of stuff because we're keeping an open mind about it and we're not rejecting, you know, guests just because they've had a different point of view than the last guest that we've had on. And, you know, we're learning from you as much as we're learning from everybody else. And that's the thing is that we should be open to this subject and say, you know, it's not, you know, I'm definitely said I would reticuli B or A or whatever uh, beings that are here. And that's it. That's the end of it. No, no, it's the tall whites. We don't know. It could be the, all of the above, which I keep mentioning, you know, it could be the case yeah. that we're dealing with multitude of different things, which mm -hmm. then I could understand why the government would be, whoa, 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 let's, you know, ease the public into this because it's a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, what I there's a scientific American article that kind of made the same um, argument is that looking into these things that we weren't looking into because of this irrational taboo means that we were not trying to investigate genuine anomalous, um, you know, sightings, uh, reports. And that would be like you kind of had mentioned earlier, even meteorological. Uh, meteorological weather kind of anomalies like tear in the sky you know they think that that wasn't necessarily a portal they think that might be something no one's seen weather do before and if that's the case that's science that's a scientific discovery mm -hmm. and i think that uh even if you are of the perspective that you know aliens aren't coming here then you know you still should be interested in looking into this because that would mean that you would agree there are answers to be discovered there. And we don't, you don't have to worry about your worldview being destroyed because we're not going to find aliens anyway. So whatever it is we'll find is going to be a scientific discovery. So even if you're skeptical, you should want to look into all of this. And I think that's a real exciting aspect, really. I think it's exciting that, um, and it says something to those of us who didn't agree with that, you know, Condon report conclusion, which is 
a lot of people and a lot of scientists uh, that uh, there was there is something to be learned. And I think those good discoveries are going to be interesting. You know, we may be able to finally figure out if there is ball plasma or if, uh, you know, um, the nature of some of this other stuff. Uh, I think that's exciting. Yeah. And if we could get closer to them and even if it is intelligence, can we communicate with them? That's that's without military intervention, not sending jets, you know, with uh, weapons attached to it to say hello, because I think that's a little bit aggressive. But can we communicate with whatever yeah. it is that's out there? That'd be great. That'd be uh, well, we haven't figured that out yet. I guess just the admittance that these things are here, I guess, is step number one. We're still a ways away from trying to actually make uh, contact or anything with them or get close to them because obviously we can't. <laughs> They're way too fast. Yeah. Way too yeah. fast. Yeah. <clears throat> We actually had one of our um, viewers he sent me a private message and he says, hey, when you get a, a, a guest on next time, try asking them something that hasn't really been asked before. So his perspective is that whenever we discuss, you know, Tic Tacs or UAPs, everybody always talks about their characteristics, how they behave, how they're observed, the speeds and everything else. But his thoughts are, is anybody doing work on perhaps how they're communicating. So like, for example, with the Tic Tac incident, there was apparently like a mothership under the water that these things were, you know, somehow communicating with. Do you think there would be a way to pick up on that communication? And my initial thought was, well, if it's conscious base, which it seems to be like you think and you're here, you think and you're there, how does anybody intercept that? But his perspective, and it seems like a science-minded guy that would have that kind of a question, right? Like, why are you spending so much time focusing on their characteristics? Spend more time on how do they actually run? Like, can we pick up mm. RF frequencies or something they're emitting that would maybe be a better indicator than just waiting for them to happen and catch it on camera? Maybe there's yeah. other things we're not we're not pointing instruments at that we should be. Yeah, well, that's what's really exciting about the science in this stuff, because that's what scientists, that's how they think, and that's what they're doing. So those OSAP dirds, those uh, defense intelligence reports that uh, the OSAP group produced, and in fact, the military is kind of giving the impression that, that that's all they did. We just asked them to write these papers, that's it. We don't know what else they did. If they were doing paranormal research, we don't know about that. It, you know, that's in debate. That's not what Lekatsky, who ran the thing, claims. But those reports are exactly doing what he's suggesting. They're like, okay, if they're doing all of these things, we think we're observing, how do they do it? And that's what those papers are. They're theoretical scientific papers on how they may be doing this or that. And there are a lot of scientists doing that sort of work, and we're doing a lot of that sort of thing at SEU, um, is that sort of thing as well. And even if you get to the telepathy or, you know, being able to, to speak mind to mind, that's science. So even at, you know, even for decades, scientists across the world take that as a science question because there have to be some kind of mechanics to it. So what how is that signal or thought getting from me to you? What is the science of thoughts? What is the matter of thoughts? How do you figure that out? How do you figure out how they're communicating back and forth? I mean, there's scientists that believe we can figure that sort of thing out. So all of it is a science that, you know, they believe we could possibly tap into. So that's what's really exciting is, is people coming to, you know, speculating along those lines and, and, um, doing testing to figure that out. And that's the kind of thing that drives then the types of sensors that we need to use, like they put on the top of the Harvard Observatory. Um, just recently with Project Galileo is, you know, they're they're thinking about, just like we are at SCU, what are what's the type of information we need? A video alone is not going to be evidence of anything anomalous. There's just not enough data there. So how much data do we need? We need IR, you know, as much as possible, um, radar and setting that threshold and then coming up with, okay, well, how do we get that data? And like Terra in the Sky, that documentary with the UAPX guys, many of those are SCU guys as well. You know, um, that's what they did. They were like, here's the stuff we need. So they gathered all those instruments and put them on the roof and you'd see they're among tons of stuff um, to gather as much information as you can. 
Uh, the hard part is going through and analyzing that information afterwards. But um, that's what's starting to happen is, you know, somebody thinking, you know, if they're communicating, they could be communicating on a quantum level and quantum communication is a real thing. Even the military is like looking into, I don't get it at all. It's way above my head, but um, that if they're doing this, then we need to have a meter, you know, along with it. So if we capture our video, we're also seeing if we're getting this type of like quantum signature yeah. uh, to be able to prove there's a relation. So that's, what's driving all of that sort of stuff. So it's really exciting that all of this is happening. We actually had those guys on the show. Uh, we had, well, Caroline Corey, because she produced the mm -hmm. movie, but uh, David Altman and David Mason, two of her um, um, stars from the movie. And Dave Mason is this brilliant mind that was taking state-of-the-art electronics and tweaking them and rewiring them to be able to view different things. So he basically took telescopes that could see a light in the sky, transfer the light form into like an audio waveform. So mm -hmm. it gives a it gives that light a unique acoustic signature. So very easily you could say, okay, that's a 747 because that light will always have that same waveform. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have people using the brilliant mind trying to do exactly that, create instrumentation that you can catch something one day to get that irrefutable evidence because a picture is just a picture. It could be a defect in the lens or a lighting, you know, illusion. It could be, everybody has a million and one ways to poo poo on your photo, your video. I mean, how we've had photos and videos for 70 years, none of it's been conclusive enough to we can also agree that, yeah, that's the real deal. Um, and I'm sure there have been some real deal videos that people have seen and, you know, they got, they got trashed as well, but uh, it, you know, the science mind is where things are going to go. Quantum physics, you know, as uh, out there as it used to seem, the more into it you get, the more plausible all this becomes, you know, including things like time travel and everything else. So, you know, science and, spirituality or the theory of the unknown is closer than ever. Uh, and one is making it possible for the other to exist. So I think we're getting closer with the skeptics and, you know, the believers, uh, because if we can find a scientific link, science is proven, repeatable, demonstrable, documentable. So if you can get something that's really the real nuts and bolts, uh, I guess, aside from an alien body, but I'm sure people would even refute it's not real on that end either too. Right. So um, we do have to be focused on that science for sure. Yeah. I want to say if it's okay, plug uh, my girlfriend's conference, the International UFO Congress. Nice. Um, What's your girlfriend's name? Let's we'll give her a proper 16th. plug. Yeah, Karen, Karen Brard. Okay. So, yeah, that's October 12th through the 16th. Uh, UFOcongress.com is a website. And they're going to have a lot of people, you know, Bryce Zabel, Ben Hansen, Dr. Michael Masters who's uh works with SCU. I'm not sure if you've had him, but he yeah, has two weeks ago. He was on our show. Yeah. Okay, great. I thought I we saw got them all baby. We get all the big. Yeah. Games. So James Fox is going to be premiering his new movie there. That's cool. Um, Yeah. We've got a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing that movie as well. That's that. Uh, yeah. He's, mm -hmm. he's committed to come on our show as soon as the movie was done. So movie's done now, James. Let's get on it, buddy. We need you on the show. <laughs> so with uh, Den of Geeks, how, how, or Den of Geek, I should say, uh, how did that get started? How did you get involved with that? So with Open Mind, uh, luckily, because, you know, we were one of the few outlets out there. I think we were the, maybe the only outlet committed to the topic that was doing their best to be journalistically rigorous, you know, like any other uh, paper out there. And um, so we got a lot of attention from other media outlets and we worked with them quite a bit. So um, that's how I got to know a lot of these people. Uh, Bryce Abel, in fact, was kind of along those lines. And so um, then, so I started getting invited to National Geographic stuff. I especially had a great relationship with them, some Sony stuff. And they were doing things like inviting freelancers on trips and things to get to know kind of the topics better. And so uh, Den of Geek would get invited on those as well. So some pretty cool stuff, like uh, the editor that I worked with who invited me to then freelance write with Den of Geek, he was with me on a trip to uh, Turkey uh, where we went to these studios for the filming of Mars uh, mini series that was kind of half documentary and then half, um, you know, fiction, drama. And it was really cool. It was a really cool show. So we got to hang out there with the actors and actresses. Um, 
That was fun because one of the actors in that was is also in Resident Alien. I'm not sure if you guys are watching it, yes. but it's hilarious. Yeah. It's yeah. really good. It's shot so, in our backyard, um, actually. Yeah, he went, yeah, he's the mayor. He was also in that Mars series. But yeah, so that's how we got to know each other. Um, and they just were really into the topic. They kept inviting me to write about the topic. And uh, I'm into sci-fi. So I started writing, you know, some sci-fi stuff for them, covering like the Orville and stuff like that. So, and then covering stuff at uh, Comic-Con with them. And yeah, so that's how it started. Um, but I, I'm pretty proud of the pieces that I wrote for them too, because I really broke some news in some of those pieces. Um, I think one of them is referenced in the Lekatsky book. Uh, so yeah, so mm -hmm. it, it was really fun working with those guys. And I still work with them. In fact, you know, I was hanging out with them at, at uh, Comic Con just last month, and they brought in The Rock. So I got a selfie with uh, The Rock that is on my Instagram. The problem is my thumbs partial the way into it, like covers up about this much oh, of yeah. picture. But <laughs> <laughs> at least you didn't cut his head off with the height difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I was ready for that. It's definitely angled way up. <laughs> That's when you crop everything to just a smaller picture. It's right hard now. to yeah. crop in a head That's if it's not there, do. though. I know, yeah, right? Half my head is here. It's yeah. like this. <laughs> like those old Polaroid pictures when you would just get that bleed. Yeah. It would mm -hmm. just like, yeah, fade away. Um, but yeah, people went nuts when he came out. I mean, yeah. they went crazy. So um, luckily we knew he was coming, but they kind of were surprising most of the other people. So do you ever people were screaming. Ever meet What's anybody? That? Do you ever meet anybody famous that is a huge UFO buff? Oh yeah, a lot. A lot of actors and actresses are really into this topic because they're really a lot of them are pretty intelligent, and a lot of them are just you know laid back, yeah, pretty cool people that you'd meet. Um, uh, and let's see, who can I think of? Like two of the people that I've talked to the most were. Shatner and Aykroyd. Those are my some of my favorites. Proud Canadian Dan, boys. Yeah. Yeah. Dan Aykroyd is so into the topic. He, he just is. wanted to keep talking and talking. And he was maybe up from Coneheads, on... right? When he made that movie in the 90s. Well, he's been into paranormal since his grandpa. I think it was his grandpa who was into the occult and ghost hunting and everything. So, you know, like you, the terms that he used in Ghostbusters, like EMF reader and ectoplasm you know those are all terms that are used in real yeah. ghost hunting yeah. so he knew all of that from I that so he's that. been yeah. into this and he was into the latest news like you know he wanted to talk about all the latest things going on i was asking him this wasn't long after chicago hair and there were rumors that he had one of the photos from chicago hair so um but yeah i was asking him he was up to speed on all the latest it was pretty incredible yeah, I've seen him a few times, different documentaries and different news stuff talking about UAPs and UFOs. And the guy's like an encyclopedia, like yeah. just list off yep. dates and names and stuff. So, yeah, he would actually yeah. be a good a candidate, like a good person for us to reach out to and yeah, try to get him sure. on. Like, it'd be great to talk with him about UAPs. Oh, yeah. My yeah. favorite's probably Billy Corgan, though, um, just because I grew up with his music. You know, in college, I was working for the radio station when a lot of that music was coming out. Right. So it's like really, you know, big in my life. And uh, yeah, that was really cool what, to meet what was, him and talk yeah. to him a bit about this stuff. What, what was, uh, did he have an experience or anything? No. So I was, this was funny. So I was at this conference in LA that my girlfriend decided to get a booth there that we were running. And it's like this huge metaphysical kind of uh, fair type of thing where it's mostly vendors and booths and stuff like that. Right. Um, and the people are extremely weird and that is one field too, where it's way, it's very slimy. Like half the people that I think are vendors don't really believe in what they're selling. They're, they're just trying to sell the craziest thing to people right. snake um, oil. possible. Yeah. Snake oil people. Totally. Yeah. So it's, it's a really strange environment, but, uh, early in the morning, like very early, we were like maybe one of the a huge room of vendors, huge. And there was maybe me and maybe five other vendors out of 200 that were there even getting ready. Um, and this is like, you know, the show's going to start in half an hour. Um, and this guy comes, you know, to our table, he's looking at my magazines and I'm kind of, you know, I see that he has this long shirt on and Billy Corkin always wears those long shirts. Um, kind of an Asian kind of inspired type of style, I think. 
and uh, he was with his kid. And I looked at him and I was like, are you? And he said, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just talked to him. I was like, are you into the topic? And he's like, yeah, totally. Uh, at the time, you know, I was all excited because I had been talk talking to Tom DeLong about all the stuff that he was doing. And I was like, yeah, you know, Tom DeLong's really into this. And yeah, he was like, oh, yeah, this is all real. You know, a lot of stuff's being hidden, that kind of thing. And yeah, so we talked for a minute or so. And then he went on. He was like, maybe they let him in early or something, I think, um, mm -hmm. so he could walk around unadulterated. But uh, yeah, that was super cool. That was really, really cool. Yeah, it's great to see the, the you know, so-called stars or famous people come out and talk about this as well yeah. and, and their experiences. I know Billy Cyrus and Miley Cyrus have, have come out and said they've had experiences mm -hmm. and stuff like that as well. So, and it just gives more credibility and, you know, for everybody out there that's still skeptic on it, that a lot of people are seeing this, including people that you watch on TV or listen to on the radio or whatever, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. it gives, it, it's, it's starting to boom a lot more. But do you think, because you were mentioning about all these different organizations, you got NASA, the Scientific Coalition, and uh, Galileo Project. Do you think they're going to step on each other's toes? Do you think there's going to be an amalgam amalgamate? Or like, you know, they're going to get together at some point and just form a big organization. Uh, do you think they're going to work well together at this point? I think that so far, it seems like everybody's very open. Right. And one of the great things about what's going on now is the SCU is kind of in the middle of it. Like we've been doing this, first of all, our board, um, the majority of us have been doing this stuff for decades, some for many decades. So we've got a lot of experience in this topic. We know a lot of different people and the serious people doing stuff. And uh, so we're the perfect place to go to um, network. Um, and that's, you know, we serve that purpose very well, even with some government agencies at our last conference. Um, and we're continuing to do that. So that's what's really exciting is we get to play a role in connecting everybody. I, I don't think there'll be one big organization and I'm not sure there should be. And the reason why is that there's varying levels of um, scrutiny. Um, it's kind of like in media, like the New York Times is the highest. They triple check everything. Uh, you have to have, uh, I don't even think they take anonymous witnesses at all. Right. Uh, so, you know, they have the highest level of scrutiny in, in the media. NASA, for example, would be that. And, and it is in space. You know, I think the European Space Agency um, had come to the conclusion that there was water signatures on Mars a year before NASA confirmed it. They had the same data. It's just NASA has a higher level of scrutiny that uh, their their bar is set very high. So that's the same for these organizations. Galileo has a different one than the SCU does, than NASA does. Um, every, it's because of you know who we represent and work with, but it's also um, reputation and just how much scrutiny we think it needs to meet. Um, for an SEU, for example, ours would probably be one of the lowest, um, which isn't bad. We're closer to the work. So we want to come out of the gate and say, hey, we think we've made a discovery. Um, we want to be respectable enough. And I think we are at this point to, to have other organizations look at it and see what they think and beat it up. Right. Um, but at least take it seriously and start to uh, investigate whatever this discovery is or something along those lines. So that's, that's, I think, uh, the way that we can all work together, kind of still maintain kind of separate organizations. Um, but yeah, you kind of have a ladder effect because hopefully there'll be other organizations like us. Let's say UAPX um, disagrees with our findings. The SEU says, well, we're not you know sure about that conclusion. And UAPX feels more comfortable. They have a relationship with NASA and they get it to NASA or to Galileo um galileo works on it and they agree with uapx you know and then it moves up the ladder that way it's right. better when you have more involvement so that it can come from all these directions and do you think that our organizations like mufon and all that is that going to be pretty much obsolete because we have these big players now that are coming out mm -hmm. uh, big names big uh, you know scientists so do you think that's sort of going to be just something that's going to die out eventually or is you think it's still going to be going strong uh even though we have these big hitters now taking care of the the, the data well i mean i think 
You know, SCU, a lot of us come from MUFON and we still appreciate MUFON and what they do. And they definitely still have a big role right now because they're the largest UFO reporting center right. out there um, by far. And so that's a lot of data coming in. And that's what everybody wants and needs right now is data to work off of, to figure something out about this stuff. So that's the role they currently play and what makes them important. Um, and it'll be up to them to see how they move beyond that. I think it would be a smart move that if they just focus on that, you know, just the process of having investigators out there getting reports and get, and, you know, um, having those reports available for government agencies and the public and scientific agencies, you know, everybody, that would be the most important thing they could do. And they should just, they, it would be wise of them to focus and get that down before they kind of start to do other things. But um, yeah, so we'll see what happens with that, but that makes them a, a big deal. Um, and similar to kind of what we want to do with Enigma Labs, where we want to take reports and uh, we want to analyze those reports and have them in databases that uh, researchers can then also analyze that data. So that's a big thing that we're doing is that end. And that's the main thing. And, and the big thing that we're doing is collecting data, making it available first via app to the public for everybody to peruse and um, also then to make that data book um, available on the technology side, you know, all of those requirements. So other researchers can make their own applications and everything to crunch the data as well. Nice. Louis, do you have any final questions for our guests? Today? Yeah. Where can people uh, learn more about you, Alejandro, or follow some of your current projects? Yeah. So I, the social media, the only social media I'm really on is uh, Twitter. So you can see me there at Alejandro T. Rojas. And then uh, that's a good way. Otherwise, I still run the website, openminds.tv. It's essentially archival at this point because uh, I'm not adding anything there. But we've got dozens and hundreds, thousands of articles on there that were written over a period of a decade by a lot of great writers. So um, a lot of data in there for people to get into um, to learn stuff. So uh, you can find me there. And then, uh, you know, Enigma Labs, we're kind of not totally out there yet, but we're going to be sharing more and more information with people. Uh, I've been developing a UAP library of articles about uh, lots of different topics that I think is way more comprehensive and unbiased than like what you'll find on Wikipedia or something. So I'm extremely excited about getting that out because we've got a lot of great uh, writers and articles in there. And we're hoping to get that kind of information on our website um, fairly soon. So in the next couple months. So we're going to slowly be rolling stuff out here. Um, and I'm, it's it's just a super exciting time because all of these groups are working together. And it's a lot of intelligent people that are cognizant of the issues um, to working in this field, but also working with government agencies and all this kind of these disparate groups with their different interests. Um, and so I think everybody's pretty wise about working around that and doing what they can um, for whatever they're focused on. And um, that's really exciting because uh, I think there's a lot of information that is going to be good and solid and extremely interesting coming out um, in the next few months and years. Yeah, it is definitely an exciting time. And uh, we were mm -hmm. very excited to have you on today's show. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day. Uh, again, you're one of the big name guys we like to always refer to that we're proud to have on the show. Uh, and it means Thank a lot you. when you, you know, you, we don't pay you to come on here. And uh, you're not paying us to share your opinion. So uh, to do this on a Sunday, I'm sure you have other things you'd rather be doing. But, um, you know, your dedication to the movement is warranted. Uh, you, we consider you thank a you. big player in this. And uh, we're super happy that you agreed to come on our show. So thank you for thank that. Thank you very hopefully much. We have, hopefully we have you back one day. Thanks. And one more plug, UFOcongress.com. Definitely check that out. I MC it. So go buy a ticket and come out. It's a lot of fun. Well done, Aliando Rojas. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you very much.